Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Good evening and welcome to tonight's Lobby Talk on Muslims in Pennsylvania. My name is Jonathan Brockup, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and History here at Penn State. And I'm a specialist on Islamic law and comparative ethics. Before I ask our panelists to introduce themselves, I want to thank all of you for coming to this event. We are very much looking forward to uh, answering your questions and having a conversation with you on this important topic, and I'm very pleased to see so many of you here. It's not easy to talk about one's faith in public, particularly when you belong to a minority religious tradition. Some Muslims uh, have been here for generations. Others are new immigrants. Many are converts. And altogether, there are somewhere between four and six million Muslims in the United States today. In all cases, they enjoy the religious freedom that's guaranteed to all of us by our Constitution, yet they also face prejudice and even fear on a daily basis. Therefore, I'm particularly grateful to our panelists, uh, Sakiba Khan, Mumina Kowalski, Abdullah Yavas, and Jordan Lane for coming and joining us tonight and agreeing to talk about their experiences. I'm going to ask each one of them to introduce themselves first, then we'll have a little conversation among us, and then um, about 20 minutes in, I'll be turning to you and we'll be inviting your questions and comments. So first of all, uh, Sakiba Khan, would you please introduce yourself to the audience? Well, hi, I'm Sakiba Khan. I'm a senior at State High. Well, I've been living in State College for a year. I moved last year from a small town called Dubois. <laughs> if most of you have heard of that town, I was the only Muslim, well, one of the only Muslim families living in Dubois at that time. And after I moved, I realized how diverse State College is, and <laughs> compared to Dubois at least. <laughs> and my parents are originally from Bangladesh, Though I was born and brought up in America, we go to Bangladesh every summer, and I love the culture there. Thank you. My name is Mumina Kowalski, and I have been a resident of State College for the past 27 years. I am a lifelong Pennsylvania resident. I grew up in Pittsburgh, and I am a convert to Islam. I converted in 1978, so I have really been a Muslim, uh, actually several years longer than I have been. I was born and catechized in the, in the Lutheran Church. So uh, I've reached that critical juncture of my life where the, uh, the majority of years I've lived as a Muslim. I uh, went to school in, as I said, Pittsburgh, I went to a women's college called Chatham College in the 70s, which might say something to those of you who know about women's colleges in the 70s. Are, uh, pretty much education was a feminist e education, and I studied art, so my whole outlook is, was about creativity, and also about critical thinking, which is something that my teachers gave me there. And so many people, including my family, were quite surprised when in 1978 I, I declared uh, my uh, interest and my conversion to Islam. But I haven't looked back and I have no regrets. Uh, I've raised five children in Islam. I am married and uh, living in Center County. and. Uh, Currently, I'm studying, again, now a master's degree with the Hartford Seminary. Ingrid Matson is my advisor. And I'm getting a degree in Islamic studies and Muslim-Christian relations. So I'm enjoying that very much. I am also uh, on the rotation of the clergy column in the Center Daily Times. So my idea is to try to 
present Islam to Center County, uh, Center Daily Times readers in small bits with an American twist. <laughs> um, hello, I'm uh, Abdullah Yawas. I'm currently a professor of business administration at Penn State. Um, I was born in a little village in Turkey, um, in case you couldn't tell from my accent. I'm <laughs> the only one who wasn't born in the United States in this panel. Um, then moved here after finishing um, undergraduate studies in Istanbul, moved to Iowa City, Iowa, where I did my graduate studies. And that was a quite a shock, going from a 15 million city to a city of 50,000 um, population. Um, but I ended up loving Iowa City and, and the cornfields around it, and the people were incredibly very nice. Um, then I moved to Penn State in 1992. Since then, I've been teaching here, doing research, getting involved in a number of community activities. Um, I'm married to um, Jamile Yavas, who is also a faculty member here at Penn State. And we have two beautiful daughters, uh, Maryam and Sarah. Um, Maryam is in second grade, and Sarah is four and a half years old. I'm Jordan Lane. Um, I've been a Muslim for four years now, as of September. And um, I'm a student in the College of Education. I'm super senior. And uh, I'm actually waiting to finish my thesis. I'm doing pre-service teachers' attitudes about Islam. That's in progress. And um, there's not much to say except that I grew up here. I've spent my entire life in uh, the vicinity of State College. And um, yeah, I'm fully American and fully Muslim. <laughs> That's about it for now. Well, we had, have had quite a bit of uh, conversation uh, among the five of us. And I've had the pleasure of knowing actually all the panelists uh, in different sorts of ways in the past couple of years. One of the things we were talking about is the fact that we speak of the Abrahamic traditions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And indeed, Islam seems so similar to uh, Christian daily practice. Muslims pray, uh, they give alms, there is a foundation of charity and caring for others. But as we were talking, in fact, the um, daily practice of prayer is quite different in Islam than it is in the Christian tradition. And in fact, um, Jordan was sharing that this was a particular difficulty for her when she converted. One of the things that I want to start with in our conversation is some of these daily life aspects of how Islam is lived out. And what are some of the issues that Muslims face in Center County as they try to live out their Islam? So I invite any of you to respond to that. Jordan, if you care to tell the story, that would be delightful. Um, as I was just telling Dr. Bracca, one of the most difficult um, parts of adjusting to Muslim life is the ritual prayer. When I first converted, um, I knew a lot about Islam when it came to the basics, when it came to the belief, what we call aqidah, but um, not so much the practice. I really didn't know what the intricacies of daily life meant. And I thought to myself, oh, five times a day. I pray all the time. That's nothing. But what people don't realize when they're um, entering Islam is that we have different types of prayer. The types of prayer that um, Christians do, like daily remembrance of God as you're, as you're say, driving your car, or, or you um, invoke God's name before you eat, or something like that. Um, that, is, that is pretty common to religious Christians, but um, what we have no concept of in Christianity, but we do have in Islam, is ritual prayer, which requires a specific type of uh, washing, where you have to wash your hands and your face and everything before you do it. You have to wear a spe um, specific type of clothing, uh, and there are certain movements you have to do, not to mention that all of the <laughs> prayers are in Arabic. So if you don't speak Arabic, which I had a very, very rudimentary knowledge of it entering, uh, it's really difficult. You have to memorize everything. And that's before you can even 
go through a day. You have to do that five times a day from the second you accept Islam as your faith. So it's really sort of overwhelming, but thank God it, it's gotten significantly easier over time for me. I think, yeah, it's, it's overwhelming, but I, I hope that people don't get the idea that it's something insurmountable because really it's a seven line prayer. And if you had it on a piece of paper and said it five times a day, you're gonna learn it about a week. So it's not insurmountable. And really when we talk about ritual prayer or formal prayer, the formalities in Islam are very small, really, compared to, say, liturgical formalities in a church. Say, for, for instance, if you were studying to become a pastor or a priest, you would have to learn a lot of formal things. Where in Islam, actually, the practitioner, every practitioner, learns the prayer, does the fasting, pays the charity. And so it's, it's, it's more of a, to me, an egalitarian idea. But one of the difficulties, it seems to me, is precisely finding the place to do the ritual washing, finding the right place to, to pray, right. not to mention being allowed to take off for a few minutes so that you can go back and right. pray. I recall living in Cairo, you know, I'd be in a bookstore and suddenly the guy I was talking to disappears for five minutes and <laughs> so I realized funny. that, oh, he just went to the back to, to do his prayer. Exactly. And it's completely accepted. Right. But, you know, if you do the same thing in Walmart, um, as we know, <laughs> um, it can be very difficult to get permission to have time off. Mm -hmm. I would like to add that prayer was not meant to be a difficult task. I mean, that was not God's intention. It was meant to be a way to devote yourself to God. And so, I mean, if you can't, in circumstances where you can't find water to do the ablation or you can't find a place, I mean, then you can just make your own place and you don't have to do the normal washing of the face and hand. I mean, there are circumstances where God wants to make it easiest for us. We do have a busier daily life schedule here too, which um, sometimes makes it harder to find the time because prayers uh, need to be done at certain time intervals. Uh, but on the other hand, praying is more rewarding in a busy schedule like that because you can get overwhelmed and, and, and just let the whole day go by without remembrance of God. Uh, and prayer sort of force you to take off a few minutes um, reconnect, um, and then go back to your busy schedule again. So in that sense, um, it's, it's more rewarding or more um, enriching uh, to be able to do the prayers in a, in a busy schedule like this. Right. Now, ritual prayer that we're talking about, the requirement to pray five times a day, um, the first one, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is um, at the very moment of dawn, so it's, it comes pretty early. Um, and then this, though, is not the only kind of prayer in the Islamic tradition, right? There are, are other kinds of prayer. Can you tell us a little bit about those sorts of prayer and when they're done and, and how, in fact, they differ a little bit from things we might be familiar with? Well, um, like I said, the two types of prayer that are pretty similar to what religious Christians do. There's uh, dua, which is like, it's called a supplication to God, where you ask God um, for something, for whether it's something spiritual or something in the earth, um, just asking God to help you with something, anything you need in your life. And also dhikr, which is um, remembrance. Like, um, it's just basically praising God, thinking about the qualities, um, of God that we know, the, the, such as the, the names of Allah, the 99 names of Allah, um, to bring us closer to God. And you can do that at any time. It's, it's spontaneous. Yeah. It's, you know, oh God, help me with my homework, or right. Right. don't let me eat that piece of chocolate cake, or um, anything as simple or as, you know, grand as you want it to be. I mean, that is basically Doa. And you see with Muslims, they raise their hands this way, whereas, you know, these are so similar. I mean, it's only a, you know, 
change of position slight. I know that when I'm stressed out with all the exams in school, I just take two minutes and say a prayer, and it just makes me feel a lot better, a lot more confident about myself. Now, the ritual prayer, as you said, is in Arabic, but the du'a, um, then you would say in English, right? Mm -hmm. In your own language yeah. or any language that you speak. Right. So it's more of a personal connection in that way. Um, I wanted to talk also a little bit about 9-11 uh, and, and what it's like to, to be a Muslim after that moment in time. Now, Sakiba, you were 13? <laughs> yes, 13 or 14. I was in seventh grade, and most people did not know what a Muslim was until 9-11. And so when they would hear it on television constantly, they started asking me, innocently asking me questions about it, questions about Islam, like, um, do you guys follow polygamy and questions like that. And so it gave me a really good opportunity to get the name out, to get Islam out and what it means to me. Were you comfortable with that role or was that a difficult time for you? Uh, actually, I was very comfortable with that role. Initially, I was just like hesitant on what they think of Islam and I didn't want them to think of it as a terroristic religion. So, I mean, getting that word out, I thought that it was a very important thing for me as a Muslim to do. Mm -hmm. It's amazing that you were comfortable with that role at the age of 13. I mean, that's a lot to ask of right. a child of 13. And, and really, it was you know, a lot of stress, I, I, I believe, on a lot of families. I have five children, and um, you know, these, these were times that were difficult for us. So that we, you know, and I was very concerned about my children at that time, that they be able to uh, feel comfortable in the public space. And um, in many ways in State College, we were very comfortable. We were made to feel um, okay by this community. And it was, it was wonderful. Our, our, our mosque, our masjid received a lot of calls of, of support and concern for our safety and uh, we were very active trying to, um, we, we organized an open house immediately. Uh, mm -hmm. Myself and other families felt immediately that we needed to open our um, place of worship up so that people could, you know, feel comfortable with us. And, but at the same time, you know, there were just so many issues that we had to, to deal with personally. And um, many people, for the first time, you know, started to leer at us openly. My sons, in particular, were very protective of me. They, I have become used to people staring at me with the, the scarf. And I almost like a horse with blinders. I <laughs> go through my daily uh, uh, shopping trips or wherever I'm doing. But, uh, my sons, if they were with me, they would be very upset when people would look at us with a hard look and want to, you know, defend me from these types of uh, aggression. Hmm. I guess living in a small town of Dubois where, I mean, living there for the past 13 years, when I was 13 years old, 9-11 happened, living there for so long and knowing so many people in that town, I just never had to face criticism. So that also made me very comfortable to talk openly about my religion. You also were mentioning the other day, Abdullah, that um, you felt you had a lot of support here uh, in State College from That among was a very emotional day. On one hand, um, there was this tragic, horrific event that killed so many innocent people. Um, and at the same time, it brought up the best in, among some of, some of the uh, members of, of State College. I, I got, I still keep them, I got a lot of telephone calls, letters, um, some of them towards, uh, addressed to me, some of them asking me if I knew any students uh, who might need protection, that they would open their homes to these students. Um, my dean came down, downstairs to my office to see how I was doing, my colleagues were concerned. Um, so it was very emotional on, on both levels. Um, and Jordan, you converted to Islam then after 9-11. Yeah, actually, what was it's, the connection it's sort of funny. Um, I actually had been studying Islam for about three years at that point. Um, I was a senior in high school when 9-11 happened, and uh, I bought the Quran when I was 15. 
And uh, I didn't actually get into reading it, which is another story, until I was about 16. But I was studying Islam um, through other sources, reading about it, Karen Armstrong, et cetera, that, um, books and things like that. But I didn't know any Muslims. Um, at the same time, that was around the time when I was starting to realize that I was, in fact, Muslim. Um, but I didn't convert until my freshman year of college, which is a year after that. But at any rate, everyone, all of my friends, because I did go to a very small school and my graduating class was 84 people. Um, everyone knew me, everyone knew I was interested in Islam, and everyone sort of saw me as the representative mm -hmm. and asked me all of the questions even though I wasn't Muslim yet. <laughs> so <laughs> when it happened, I thought to myself, oh no, please don't let it be Muslim. <laughs> and of course, my worst fears were realized. And so every day for all of my senior year, I had to answer questions like, well, why do they blow up innocent people? Why do they hate us? Why, um, why America? What did we ever do to them? And listen to things like, oh, we should just nuke the whole Middle East and all of that. So I found myself um, on the defensive, even though at that time I wasn't technically Muslim yet. So. Yeah, that question, why do they hate us, is particularly strange for all of you here, I would think, right? Because in a sense, you're both they and us. Who is they and who are us? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that raises those questions. You get an idea, I think, all of you out in the audience, of the types of things that uh, we'd be very happy to entertain. Um, now it's time that I want to uh, turn to you and invite your questions and, and your comments. Um, anything at all that, uh, that you'd like to ask this terrific group of panelists that we have up here this evening? You were talking earlier about the prayer, and it has to do with the workplace. I happen to be a retired anesthesiologist, and I'm in the operating room from 7 in the morning till 5 at night, mm. and uh, I barely have time to get lunch. Now, how do my colleagues who uh, have to pray, how do, they, how do they manage that? Thank you very much. Well, I don't, I don't know. Like, I... Going, being a high school student and going to school from 6 in the morning to 2 and then having clubs afterwards, it's not always easy to pray on time. But as I said earlier, God does make exceptions for those cases where you absolutely can't take the, that five minutes off to pray. And so you can do it later in the night when you go home. I mean, it's better to pray than not to pray at all. The, the workplace issues are, are difficult for Muslims in America. I think. This is something that um, we, we must, you know, talk about because, well, I, I mean, I know most people get smoking breaks, and I know they get bathroom breaks. So if a person is going to take a 15-minute a, a break, you know, at, at or with their lunch, um, that actually could suffice for the afternoon prayer. The first prayer is the, is the dawn prayer, which if you're in, ho in your home, unless you're, you know, it's, it's probably pretty easy to accomplish that unless you're on a night shift. Um, but all of the prayer times are, have a window of time. So there's a beginning time and an end time for those particular prayers, and that's around the whole 24-hour clock. If you aren't able to make the prayer in that time, you can make up your prayer. It's a late prayer. It's considered, it's considered not optimal. Uh, the best prayer is the prayer prayed on time, but there's always the option to make it up later. I have to say this is one of the things that makes uh, practicing daily life of, of Islam very difficult because even if you have a, an employer who's willing to do this, you still have to ask for it. Right. You have to put yourself out there. You have to say, I need this time. I need this space. I need a place where I can wash. And depending on your position, if you're very high up in the hospital and you have the clout, then you can ask for that. If you're some low-ranking, newly hired person, uh, that may be very difficult to request. 
And I think it's important for us to remember just how difficult these sorts of things have to be. They require, in some sense, proactive response on the part of those of us who are not Muslim. Right. Thank you very much. Are there other questions? This is for the, uh, for the converts. I was curious, uh, for someone born to th into the tradition, the dress seems uh, more regular or something you would be used to. Why did you decide to go with a traditional or conservative approach to your dress? Do you want to take that, Jordan? Um, I can. Um, I actually had a lot of trouble with it. Um, not at first, I, not personally, but more with my family. My mother said exactly what you said. She said, I, I understand why your friends wear it. it. It makes sense. It's their culture. But I don't understand why you wear it. Do you have to wear it? And then she begs me, can you tie it in the back? Can you, you know, <laughs> can you look a little bit more American? Can you wear earrings? <laughs> And these are things that, to me, I think are silly. Sometimes I do accommodate for her, and I'll tie it in the back just to make it a little easier on her because she's been very understanding about the whole thing. Um, but what it comes down to is that I personally believe it's required. And I also think that even if it weren't required, it's a part of you. It, it makes you feel, um, it reminds you of who you are. It tells other people who you are. Um, in many ways, it sort of gives people an idea of how to treat you, and sometimes that's bad, and most of the time that's good. <laughs> and um, it puts the emphasis on something other than your physical, physical appearance. You know, it's the most uh, visible sign of a Muslim, but it's not the most important thing. Right. I mean, the beliefs and the practices are varied and, and diverse and, uh, you know, this is something that represents um, your point of view and your, your belief. Uh, and I, I also feel it's important. I've, I've been wearing the hijab for as long as I've been a Muslim. But, and, I mean, I can say just from my own uh, point of view that it does uh, affect the way people treat you. Um, I come from the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant background, so I was the majority culture. I came into the minority culture in a way by putting on hijab. So, you know, it's interesting how people then treat you differently. So, you know, it's almost like that book, Black Like Me. You take on this new characteristic and, and you, it actually is helpful because the people that don't treat you very well probably aren't worth your time. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like a... A culling you, mechanism. Yes, you a can, culling mechanism. Just, just very get good, rid of those very good. No, but there are a wide variety of, uh, of styles of Islamic dress. Um, there's the, the hijab, there's the, the face veil, there's the burqa, which is the complete uh, covering. Right. Um, and these are, many of them, located in particular regional and, and cultural spheres. Right. Um, did it ever occur to you to put on the burqa, for oh example? <laughs> No. <laughs> and, and I do actually, though. I do have a friend who used to wear the niqab, which is the face veil. Um, she, lived in, she lives in Philly, and uh, a lot of women in Philly choose to wear the niqab. And um, she was a grade school teacher, and so it worked for her. She could, she could take it off in her classroom in front of the children and just deal with them uh, in her hijab. But she found after a while that um, it was very uh, difficult for her to interact with society in the niqab, and she ended up taking it off, but with the hope that she could put it on again someday, because she liked wearing it. Thank you. Uh, there are a number of other questions. Yes, please. Um, I've always wondered, not always, but in recent years, why it is that we <laughs> emphasize so much what women wear in Islam and not what men wear. Thank you. Abdullah? No, men supposed to um, wear modest clothes, uh, not revealing or not too tight. Um, so there is a dress code for, for men as well. But I, I guess um, it's not as visible or it doesn't have to be as different as than what we're used to 
seen as, as, as headscarf. But there are specifics. I mean, um, I have to tell the story and embarrass my cousin. Uh, when he came to Egypt uh, one time and was walking down uh, the main street right by the Nile, and it was a sweltering day in the middle of summer, and he's just sweating, and so he just takes his T-shirt off. And it was as if he was naked. Right. Traffic stopped, people are staring. <laughs> it was a scene. Um, because he had seriously violated the, the dress code for, for men. Uh, the fact that he was Muslim or not Muslim made no difference whatsoever. There's an extremely well-known saying that every religion has its character, and the character of Islam is modesty. It's a huge, all-pervading statement, which means modesty in the sense of the physical modesty, but also in, in terms of you know, being generous and modest uh, to people in general and having good manners. So I think that, yeah, I, men taking off their shirts is in Islamic culture considered immodest, mm. as well as you know, people wearing shorts. So you know, if you are a tourist in a Muslim country, you should know that that would be considered offensive. Yes, please. I'm very reluctant to bring this up, but it's something that has bothered me many, many times, and that is, what does the Quran say about the infidel? Thank you very much. Actually, could I ask you a little bit more uh, to, to say just a few more words of what you've heard? Uh, obviously, and, we have please. read, and I think that um, most of us, I believe, that it's the, oh, the, the other side of your religion who says that the Quran says, shoot him or do something to him, but don't let him go. And I can't believe that. I simply can't believe that. And I'd like to know what the Quran really says. How, how do they encourage an infidel to join the, the, uh, the Muslim religion? I have to begin by answering historically that the Quran is in some ways a unique text because it came into a world of uh, religions that were, were well known. In other words, the Quran speaks directly about Judaism, directly about Christianity, as well as about monotheism. So in fact, as about polytheism, uh, the Quran has a great deal to say about other religious traditions. But I'd really like to turn to the panelists and hear how you've interpreted these Quran verses in, in your own lives, how you understand these things. Well, I think if, the danger of interpreting verses without quoting verses is, is very great, number one. I mean, the Quran is available in the public library. You're welcome to, to go and take it out and, and find those verses and see what, we're talk, what you're talking about because I'm not clear uh, what verse you're referring to. Now, in terms of infidel, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that you're talking about the word kafir. Um, and you have to remember that the Quran was revealed in the seventh century in a context, in a time and place. And it, it was revealed over a period of 23 years with uh, all kinds of things happening to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, at the time that he was receiving this revelation. So verses that are received in the beginning of the revelation primarily have to do with him being this lone uh, prophet receiving a message in the middle of a well-civilized, developed city of people who were polytheists in a tribal situation who were against him receiving or having this message of, of claiming that there was one God. And this was not their tradition. So we have that context to think about. We have also the context of the outside community outside of Mecca and even the Arabian Peninsula being a large Byzantine Empire, a Jewish community in Medina. All of these places and all of these contexts 
have, we, we know when verses were revealed and in what context they were revealed. So any scholar of the Quran is going to bring you that material. So when you just pluck a verse out, just as I, as I would pluck a verse out of the Old Testament, it would not make sense in a general sense, perhaps, or it wouldn't make sense to practitioners today in the 21st century without the context. And it's also important to note that um, there's a difference between what um, I believe you're referring to as infidels. I, I, I believe you're seeing that as non-Muslims. But the Quran distinguishes between non-Muslim monotheists, as in Christians and Jews. They're called Ahlul Kitab, the people of the book. They have their own revelations. And they're different from the term that Mu'mina used, uh, the kafirun, which are the disbelievers. And the disbelievers usually in the Quran are referring to those specific disbelievers at that time who were assailing the Muslims, who were uh, persecuting them. So your interaction with someone in a society like State College, Pennsylvania, is very different from your interaction with uh, a group of polytheists from Mecca who are trying to kill you and are trying to take your wealth and are trying to, to basically wipe your religion off the face of the earth. It's a different way of dealing with people. If I may quote a verse from the Quran uh, where it says, killing a single person is like killing the entire humanity and saving a human life is, save, is like saving the entire humanity. Um, and that's a very well-known verse. Uh, doesn't require much interpretation. Um, and that's, that is the principle for most. The killing is one of the biggest sins one can commit. Suicide is another one of the biggest sins one can commit. But because of what happened on 9-11 and, and a few events before and after. Now, unfortunately, we have this perception that um, or we see these quotations out of uh, context and, and, and we get this perception that maybe there's something, wrong, something in the religion that's causing these events. One of the things that I often hear uh, from people is this fear that Yes, you know, when, when Muslims talk to non-Muslims, they represent everything as being easy and nice and friendly. But when you read the Quran, then you find out what it's really all about. <laughs> and that's a, an easy uh, explanation to fall into. And I think the only way that one can really be convinced otherwise is precisely to look at history, to, to look at exactly how Muslims have lived and continue to live with people of different faiths um, in the variety of Muslim civilizations that are out there uh, today. So, thank you very much for that question. Um, I have a quick question to the converts. Uh, what made you change your original, uh, original religion to Islam? And by the way, I'm very proud to be Sakiba's mom. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer quickly because actually I don't think I really did change my religion in anything other than name. Um, I had always believed what I came to know as Islam. I didn't know that it existed because I wasn't taught about Islam. Um, I actually grew up in an Arab American family but they were Christian. So all I knew was Christianity and you were either a Christian or an atheist in my mind. I knew there were other religions but I didn't know much about them. So um, when I started looking into my own um, roots, my Arab roots, um, you can't really study that without studying Islam. So the more I found out about it, the more I thought, oh wow, this is what I already believe. And I didn't know any Muslims <laughs> until I had already decided to be Muslim. And I went to an MSA meeting, and to become Muslim, you take your shahada, which is your declaration of faith. And uh, I technically couldn't have even done that in high school because I didn't know two Muslims to be the witnesses, to hear me say it. So um, yeah, it really wasn't that difficult of a change for me in belief. I was an art artist and I was allowed to look at different religions, you know. Um, and I was coming of age in the 70s and status quo was just 
all up for grabs, you know, every, everything, <laughs> you know, you didn't have to be anything in particular. And, and per, for me to choose Islam was, you know, kind of different. Uh, my father thought I was joining a cult because, uh, you know, I became a Muslim during the Iranian Revolution. And Jimmy, Jim Jones or something was doing the committing suicide down in Guyana and all kinds of things were happening. But to me, intellectually, the Quran, uh, grabbed me, and uh, actually putting on hijab had a huge effect on me as a woman. Um, really, it, it's just like I, you know, separating the <laughs> the wheat from the chaff, and and uh, the practice, the everyday, the prayer, diving into that. Uh, when you when you when you ask God for guidance, I mean, I, I believe God answers you. Because I'm in front, I think I won't stand. <laughs> I wanted to ask about those everyday practices. Um, nobody said anything yet about the role of meals and food and drink, and I'd love to hear something about that. Well, that's actually um, one of the things that my family has been most supportive about. Um, first, when I first converted, I didn't eat halal. And for anyone who doesn't understand, halal is similar to kosher, except that our rules are not nearly as strict. Um, it's the way in which the animal has to be slaughtered. And um, I didn't eat halal, I, but I didn't, of course, eat pork or alcohol. Um, so my grandmother would be very careful to cook meals separately. If she was cooking ham or pork or something, she usually didn't do it when I was there to eat. But if she did, she'd use different utensils and, and uh, make sure it didn't touch the food that I was eating and things like that. She's been very, very supportive when it comes to that. Um, so that really wasn't too difficult, and you can go to a restaurant and avoid pork and alcohol pretty easily. Um, now that I've started to eat halal, it's a little more difficult, um, because I can eat kosher, and I can eat fish, and other than that, I really can't eat meat. So <laughs> it's a little more difficult, but it's, it's available, and it's more available in cities. So if I were to live in, in D.C. or Philly, it wouldn't be a problem at all. Something that I find very important is before we eat, we should always say a prayer to God to just thank Him for the food. And I know that's the same in Christianity, Judaism, just to think of thank God for giving us that food. And Muslims really hold on to that. Yeah, I think the, the whole issue of food, we usually think of halal versus haram, you know, uh, something that is okay versus something that is forbidden to us. But there's a saying that everything, God has permitted everything except that which he has been explicitly prohibited. So when we think of the vast amount of food choices in the world, um, think of all the fruits, think of all the vegetables, think of all the grains, think of all the just varieties of wonderful, delicious things. And only prohibited are certain meats where the animal has not been really blessed or, or we haven't really thought about taking that life in a, in a substantial way where we haven't purified the food or you know, we're, we're, we're mass producing you know, and slaughtering these animals with, with horrible methods. I mean, this is impacting our health. This is, a lot of Muslim Americans are more concerned with, you know, organic foods and and foods that are pure in, in a spiritual sense because, you know, we're consuming we're a consuming nation and we're and we're really being consumed by this this idea. There are some other aspects of food that I think are interesting to to bring up. Um, there is a festival of sacrifice, uh, for example. Now. This is celebrated differently in, in different places. Uh, I recall living in Tunisia where every household uh, had, a, had a sheep, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, when we were living there, my son was uh, two years old, and he really fell in love with the sheep and <laughs> was uh -oh. very attached to them. And then suddenly, one day, they were all gone. Um, Tell us a little bit about what that sacrifice is, is all about and, and what it means and how you celebrate it here. 
Again, it's, it's an animal whose life is, you know, uh, precious in that, you know, we know the story of Abraham, the whole holiday, uh, the whole Hajj ritual uh, revolves around the story of Abraham, the prophet, um, whose son it was that was going to be sacrificed. It's really inconsequential. Muslims generally say it was Ismael, whereas uh, the Christian tradition holds that it's Isaac. Uh, but it's the whole idea of sacrificing, you know, what God is asking us to do, we're doing it, whereas at the last moment the sun is withdrawn and the ram or the animal is given in, in place. But this idea of sacrifice not being that we're doing some blood sacrifice, you know, Christians kind of confuse that, you know, Old Testament, New Testament. We're talking about meat. <laughs> we're talking about feeding people. And really, this whole idea of, of Eid al-Adha, the, the feast of the sacrifice, is, is about people eating meat who might not eat meat at all in the year. Many people in the world don't eat meat like we eat meat maybe every day. Um, they have it at the two festivals. So that's another context, I think, that we as Muslims need to remember as well, because we've grown, you know, uh, wealthy Muslims living in wealthy places have the same tendency to forget the real meanings behind these things. So when animals are slaughtered, then that one third of that meat is going to your neighbors. <laughs> one third of that meat is going to your poor people in your community, and you're keeping one third for your festivities. Is this something that you're able to also do uh, here, I, I would ask you, Abdullah, I, the, I imagine right. the Eid al-Adha is a little different, or Bayram, as you would say, a little different uh, here than right. it would be in Turkey. It is. Um, in terms of the sacrifice, um, we have been consistently every year um, deciding, choosing to uh, donate the money that sort of there is a certain amount that would buy, you know, a, a sheep or, 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 or something like that in different various parts of the world. So we've elected to donate the money where the charity organizations would, on our behalf, uh, um, would then provide the meat to, to needy people in other parts of the world or in the United States. Um, in terms of celebrating the holiday, um, of course, I mean, I'm in a unique sort of position here because my parents, my bigger family are not here. So that is that because holidays are the times of the year when you get together with your parents, when you visit your uh, relatives and, and, and get their blessings. Um, but on the other hand, there is a community here. And, and the beauty, beauty of that community is that it's really a mosaic. Of, of, of the cultures of, of, of this planet. When you go to a um, holiday prayer here, um, which takes place in the morning of the first day of the holiday, um, it's, it's amazing. Different clothing, different colors, different ethnical background, different languages being spoken. Um, and it really reminds you that you're a member of, of a whole planet. Um, or else, if you're in a more homogeneous uh, society, say where I was <laughs> born and raised in Turkey, um, you, don't, you don't get that experience. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's... That's one of the amazing things about the American Muslim exactly. community. Like 80 countries of the world are, are represented by Muslims in America. And, and America is the most diverse religious country in the world. And I think that's our strength. Absolutely. As we look at the unrest around the world today, much of which seems to be explained by some in religious terms, do you see it as having a religious core to it, or do you think we should be looking elsewhere? No, I think that there's a danger in ignoring the religious element of it. Um, by saying that it's entirely political, you're disregarding a very deep set belief in every individual who is involved in any, uh, let's say, 
the Iraq conflict or the Palestinian conflict. Um, on both sides, you're ignoring something that is essential to the um, individual identity. And to do that is, is extremely dangerous. But to say that it's entirely religion is also extremely dangerous because it ignores political, economic factors, um, <coughs> everything else. That any of the conflicts in the world are such huge, complicated issues that we have to look at religion and everything else. So many of our important uh, uh, thinkers, I think, uh, talk more about the um, problems of modernity. Um, Karen Armstrong comes to mind, who can speak about different religions because she's studied them and wrote, writes about them um, in a popular way to make it easy for us to kind of um, get a grasp. And the idea of you know this um, sort of uh, Every individual interprets religion on their own, whereas you know we had traditions of scholarship in all of the basic uh, faith traditions that are being lost or are being forgotten. And you know, with the advent of modern technology, we have you know ways of communicating now that are so much faster and so much. Uh, you know, the sword is a double-edged sword. It cuts both ways so that, you know, anybody can launch a website or put out information um, and say they're an authority. Whereas before, you know, when getting back to dress, it used to be, you know, the man with the turban was a recognized uh, scholar because to wear the turban or to wear a certain kind of clothing meant that they spent their life studying. And they were recognized within their particular group um, by the clothing. Whereas now, it seems like we put on the clothing to make, you know, to make up for the lack of scholarship. I personally believe most, if not all, conflicts uh, are not religious. Um, they are political. They are about power, about land. But then religion, whenever possible, just like another instrument they can use, will be used by the parties to, to gather support. Um, and let's not forget that the biggest wars we had, especially in the last century, were not religious wars. Absolutely. Um, one of the truisms that one hears about Islam is that there is no separation between um, the politics and the religion, right? There's no separation between religion and state. Um, do you think, I mean, your, just your own personal opinion that we should try to inject more religion into politics? Do you think that uh, the separation is a generally positive thing? And of course, I'm, sp I'm asking you in your multiple identities as Muslims and Americans. That's a very difficult and very complex question. Um, more religion in politics. It depends on what your idea of religion is, because um, everyone says, you know, do you believe in Islamic government? Do you not believe in Islamic government? Well, what is Islamic government? And who do you ask? Who, who are the scholars that you follow who will determine an Islamic government? And what falls under what's acceptable in an Islamic government. Usually, historically, that has been pluralist and has allowed for different interpretations of Islam and has allowed for um, non-Muslims to live within that government uh, with different rules for them. Um, there's a danger of today allowing any one religious group, sect, um, political group to take over in the name of religion um, and have all of the say over the lives of every citizen in that country. Um, so, I don't know, I guess, I, ideally, I still believe that an, Islam, an Islamic government is possible and should happen someday. When that will happen is the big question. <laughs> I personally believe that it depends on the circumstance. I mean, Islam did start out 
kind of politically as well. I mean, our prophet was also involved in politics, so it's not such a bad thing to have religion with politics. But at the same time, nowadays especially, we see these political leaders using religion to hurt others, and I think that's very wrong. So it depends on the circumstance. I personally think um, Islam is, is secular. Um, there is, there is a very strong, there's another verse in the Quran that where it's very clear you cannot impose your religion, your way of life on others. Um, now, the question of how much religion to insert in the society, or not, that's something that the society decides. I mean, we, we insert more religion, say, in our society than the Europeans have. Um, does that mean we're not secular? Not necessarily. Um, the religion cannot be, um, in Islamic tradition, religion cannot be imposed on, on those who don't want it. Um, in fact, if, again, if you look at the Ottoman period, for instance, it's, it's very interesting. Um, not only that they didn't impose um, the religion on the minorities, um, otherwise a big chunk of the world today would be speaking Turkish and would be, would be a Muslim. <laughs> But even, um, say, in Istanbul, say, um, they would let Armenian Orthodox members to have their own panel court. Mm -hmm. They would let the Jewish um, part of the society to have their own rules and regula regulations. Um, so it was, um, it was very secular in that sense. Um, and you were subject to the rules and regulations of, of a particular religion if you chose to be a member of that religion and, and chose to be bound by the rules of, of that religion. So from that perspective, um, I believe that Islam is, is secular. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that any particular political uh, arrangement has been ordained in Islam. So, you know, when we look at history, we see a variety of political uh, appointments in various Muslim places. But it's not as if uh, that is ordained by God. We have failure of, of political Islam in many cases. But uh, we also uh, can see that there is a history, uh, there is a, a lot of information available about the Prophet's uh, constitution and his treaties and his political governance that we can glean information from to apply it to our time now. But it's just like any political experiment. Um, the American experiment is not without flaws. I mean, we have an election where is it 30% of the people are, are voting in our elections? So, I mean, this is not truly the voice of the people. And we have a prison system where the most people in the world are incarcerated in our prisons. So there are problems with our system. Let's, let's be realistic about all uh, the political systems of the world as not, we haven't found all of the answers we're still seeking. Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, all of our panelists, uh, Sakiba Khan, Mumina Kowalski, Abdullah Yavas, and Jordan Lane. And thanks to all of you for a delightful, enjoyable conversation. This has been a production of WPSU.